I took a walk on an old sheep farm. When I exited the back of that property onto the original lambing pasture, I found a solar array, newly installed solar array there. I was looking at it and I thought, well, we need clean energy, we need solar. And here's a nice wide open space where we have access to power lines and, and transmission ability. And as I was standing there looking through the chain link fence, a landscaper arrived to maintain the vegetation. And they were driving up and down the panel rows with a large mower belching smoke and behind that towing a sprayer. And what they were doing was mowing the laneways, the open space between the rows of panels. And they were spraying Roundup underneath the panels to kill that vegetation that could grow up and contact the back of the panels. And I thought, boy, this is a shame. We simply could have picked the sheep up, put the solar panels down, put the sheep right back down again. Then at that point, I walked out of there. And at the front of this park, there's a little display with a handful of sheep in it. There was a little boy and a little girl standing at the rail, maybe six and eight years old. The girl turned to the little boy and said, see, these, these are baby sheep. Baby sheep are called lambs. Lambs cut the grass. That's why the guys who come are called lambscapers. <laughs> I thought... Well, my goodness, if these children get it instantly, I can sell this. The name of the business is Solar Shepherd LLC, and we're, we're based in southeastern Massachusetts, but today we work all around New England. What we do is manage a number of different sheep flocks that we use to maintain vegetation under solar arrays. So we're sheep farmers, but the way we access additional pasture is by working with solar companies to manage that vegetation that grows under ground mount solar arrays. So Reggie and I, Reggie the Border Collie, take sheep all around New England. We move them on the solar sites and we manage them on the site in a rotational grazing strategy to maintain that vegetation. Were you a sheep farmer? Did you grow up as a sheep farmer? I did. I'm a third generation sheep farmer. However, the last generation, my generation, was predominantly a hobby farm business. And I went off to work in corporate America. Right. I was always told growing up that farming's wonderful and it's great to work with these animals. If you'd like a happy, successful life, go off to college, get a degree, go get a job in corporate America and use all your vacation time. Right. That's what I did. And I maintained a hobby farm while I did that work. The pull of the farm's too much. I reached a point where I, I simply didn't want to be indoors anymore. I, I wanted to be outdoors. I wanted to work with the animals. I wanted to I wanted to make a difference. You know, my previous corporate career was in financial services. It's actually, it's financial services that led me to launch the solar grazing business. I held roles in product development and marketing strategy, roles across the organization, essentially the thread being to use data to solve business problems. The last few years of my career, I was working on distributing ESG mutual funds. Those are you know, mutual funds with an environmental, social governance screen overlaid on them. And what really struck me was that I was spending my time day to day with these fund managers, financial managers, they're financial engineers, for, for lack of a better term. And I was struck that they truly believed that the way they could have the best impact, a positive impact on the environment was coming in every day and managing money. And it was invigorating after, you know, a couple decades of high growth or, mm-hmm. you know, tax-free income to work with a crowd that was there because they felt that managing money was how they could make a difference. It was invigorating. It gave me a mm-hmm. chance to take a step back, think about what I care about. I care about local agriculture. I care about clean energy. I care about creating opportunity for both. And that's what led me to launch Solar Shepherd. Now, when you're working on ESD and you're looking for different opportunities for this river of money that's flowing around the world, do you get introduced into the solar sector? Is that the first thing that you see? Because when you know, I first read about this, it's such a simple solution, but a very complicated problem that just it would never occur to a person that, well, well hey, this is a way I could do this. So how did you even figure out what the solar area was? I had some exposure to solar. But a big part of the driver was looking for additional land to raise sheep on and to expand our flock and to expand the profitability of the farm. In our part of the world here in Massachusetts, land is at a premium and we're losing farmland rapidly to development, to single family homes and strip malls and other developments. And as I looked around and I was trying to work through the numbers to expand the farm in a profitable way, there just just wasn't a way to do that. You know, I'd see farmland going to solar solar development on farmland. And I looked at it and I thought, well, the soil is still there. It takes healthy soil to produce wholesome meat. And the soil is still there. The solar panels are there, but they're simply out of the way of the animals. What we have is beautiful pasture with a strong fence all the way around it. 
and shade for the animals. The only thing these solar sites are lacking is fresh water. So they set about solving that problem. How do we keep the animals hydrated and ensure that they always have access to fresh water on these solar sites? And then we built the business. Now, in some ways, fund managers are easier to talk to about, you know, they have to mow all this land, right? Do you see it or do you just read about it? Do you see these farms? Oh, I, I see them. Actually, the final push for Solar Shepherd, and, you know, as an entrepreneur, I'm sure you, you feel this, you get to a point where you're confident you have an idea, you've got a concept, you have something actionable here. When do you take that leap? When do you actually launch and go for it? And, you know, my story of that day, I, I was hovering around this idea, thinking about it, thinking all the strengths and weaknesses and trying to understand what I had for a concept here. And I took a walk on an old sheep farm the next town over that was donated by the Ames family to the town of Easton. It's where they used to raise sheep. And it's a beautiful piece of property, now a public park with walking trails. It's a nice place to go. As a sheep guy, I would go there and walk around and sort of daydream a little bit about what it must have been like to raise sheep on that land. There's a nice hillside, you know, which helps the animals stay healthy walking up and down hills. There's a crystal clear stream that runs through the bottom of this little valley. There's a still pool off to the side. Sheep don't like to drink moving water. Everything about this land is perfect. And surrounding it is a, a ridge of granite that would hold your sheep in without fencing. So I was walking around there and enjoying my view and thinking about what I'd like to do here. And when I exited the back of that property onto the original lambing pasture, I found a solar array, newly installed solar array there. And, you know, that lambing pasture, that's, that's your best pasture. That's the most nutritious stuff you've got. I was looking at it and I thought, well, we need clean energy. We need solar. And here's a nice wide open space where we have access to power lines and, and transmission ability. It's sort of too bad to lose that that wonderful farmland. And as I was standing there looking through the chain link fence, a landscaper arrived to maintain the vegetation. And they were driving up and down the panel rows with a large mower, belching smoke, towing a bat wing mower, and behind that, towing a sprayer. And what they were doing was mowing the laneways, the open space between the rows of panels, and they were spraying Roundup underneath the panels to kill that vegetation that could grow up and contact the back of the panels. And I thought, boy, this is a shame. We simply could have picked the sheep up put the solar panels down, put the sheep right back down again. And we'd protect the asset, we'd reduce risk to the asset, we would enhance the soil that's there, we would have local agricultural production, locally sourced grass-fed lamb. So then at that point, I walked out of there, and at the front of this park, there's a little display with a handful of sheep in it. And I always sort of walk by to see their sheep on my way back to the truck. As I did, there was a little boy and a little girl standing at the rail, maybe six and eight years old. The girl turned to the little boy and said, see, these, these are baby sheep. Baby sheep are called lambs. Lambs cut the grass. That's why the guys who come are called lambscapers. <laughs> I thought, well, my goodness, if these children get it instantly, I can sell this. I can, yeah. I can sell this to the solar industry. And I ran home and I, I licensed the business and away we went. And the very next day, I started calling. And it took a while, but we converted our first customer. And then each, each conversion since has come faster and faster. So now the first customer, you call them up. How do you even find their number and get them on the phone? And what do they think? What well, was the pitch? You're a marketing guy. Yes. Right? Okay. What was the pitch? It's a networking sale. So I found my way to get to the centers of influence at a large solar company and networked my way there. And when I got there, you know, the, the pitch is different for different parts of the organization. When I'm talking to the operations and management folks, the O&M team, I say, listen, you know, we can come in with the sheep. We'll manage all that vegetation. There'll be no shading on the panels. There'll be no vegetation touching the back of the panels and the electrical generation equipment. And we're going to do this in a way that's not going to put dust and debris on your panels. We're not going to damage any of that dangerous equipment that's there or, or expensive equipment. Mowing these sites is dangerous. There are tractor collisions with panels. There are cut conduit, cut wiring. We take all that away with the sheep. So we can come in, we can manage the vegetation. It'll look great. You won't hear anything from your solar techs, your, your field techs about difficult access or ticks or poison ivy or anything like that. And we're going to protect your asset. On the marketing side, that pitch is, is fairly simple when you're talking to a marketing department. Everyone knows on social media, the things that score the best are, are babies and animals. 
and I can bring baby animals and put them next to your asset and talk about how we're making the world a better place. Yeah. And then at the senior most level, it's a different message. When you're talking to C-suite executives, talking about the, the grand scope of converting to clean energy. How are we going to build enough solar around this country? And, you know, the pushbacks that the solar companies hear are around the loss of farmland, around optics, around noise and maintenance, dust, all of these things. And this solar grazing opportunity answers all of that. We're not losing farmland to solar. We are farming two crops on this land. We're raising beautiful grass-fed lamb and, and we're farming the sun and, and producing clean energy. So your experience inside a bank gave you the sort of way to talk to each person before you actually even got there. It was basically an advantage just to even set the idea up. It's, it's an understanding that the key message that each individual needs to hear to act is different. I think around the world, we, we all want to live an environmentally friendly life. We all want to do what we can to improve the earth, to improve the environment, to lessen our impact. There are differences of, of opinion around how much that should cost, what sacrifices we should make, what are the important impacts to have. And when you develop something like this or, or other perhaps more sophisticated environmentally friendly things, we need to recognize that, yes, the true believers are all going to jump for this right away. It's the rest of the folks who need to be convinced. We need to show how our environmental solutions are economically viable, right. what they're going to do to have an impact. It, it can't simply be, this is clean and green, so let's do it. It's this is clean and green and it makes sense. You know, I was just thinking of like a checklist, you know, the pros and the cons, and you sort of articulated many of the pros. Is there something, you know, I mean, everything can't be a perfect solution. What, if any, are the negative or not so great consequences of doing it this way? Is there anything? There are none when it's done well. The risks here, I believe, are related to a green rush. Meaning, as this concept of solar grazing expands, I have concerns that not all of the solar grazers will be experienced sheep farmers who know what they're doing. I have concerns that, at first and foremost, all of our customers, we're, we're interviewing them as, as much as they're interviewing us. I need to know that they agree with me that animal welfare is first. That's our primary responsibility. Cutting the grass is important but we need to take care of these animals. And I do have some concerns that as this concept of solar grazing grows, there may be some who are chasing an opportunity and not providing for the animals, not executing a rotational grazing strategy that, you know, you can overgraze this land, you can damage this land. There are some professional and science considerations towards managing this land with livestock. And I want to ensure that as this grows as a practice, that we make sure that it's done responsibly. So do you have a manual and a, you know, like a whole book of how to do it? I mean, this grazing strategy sounds really, you know, fascinating. And so yes. you share that knowledge, right? You share yes. that. I, I share that knowledge with other farmers who would like to do this. You know, there are, there are a few of us doing this and got together to create a trade organization. So I, I sit on the executive board of the American Solar Grazing Association, and we partner with farmers, with ag industry groups, with solar companies, with the federal government, and we're producing a best practices manual that the nonprofit will distribute. We are providing training materials, validating other groups' training materials so we can certify that this training program that XYZ firm is offering in solar grazing does meet the standards. We have a wonderful thing here that we've created that it's a way for a publicly traded company to pay for ecosystem services. When we graze this land, we're bringing in pollinators. We're providing opportunity for wildlife. It's a wonderful thing that benefits all the surrounding communities. And it's a way that a, a publicly traded company can, can go pay for these ecosystem services by grazing. Are you putting gardeners out of business? No, not at all. These leaf blowers. <laughs> those, you know, those leaf blowers and weed whackers, they, they produce as much hydrocarbon in the atmosphere in one hour of operation as driving a Toyota Camry 1,100 miles. Right. But we're, we're not putting these landscapers out of business. I think that conceptually, these 
large tracts of land, whether you're talking about solar or open space in corporate campuses or college campuses or other places, highway, transmission lines, these wide open spaces where the lawn doesn't need to be two inches tall at 3 p.m. on Saturday afternoon for a barbecue, maybe it makes sense to manage this land with sheep. They do a great job of it. It takes them longer. It's not over in an hour. They're there for, for weeks at a time managing this vegetation. Does that matter? Does it matter that it takes time? Yeah. No, no, it doesn't. But to your question about putting landscapers out of business, we're not going to put them out of business. This allows them to focus on the high value, high impact, true gardening work. Your front lawn, you may wish to mow that and manage that at at a two inch height without the natural fertilizer that our our landscapers are going to, to deliver. But then open tracks of land. Maybe it makes more sense to do this with sheep. Okay, so you you have the concept, you get the first company to say yes. Now, I imagine that they're probably going to say, okay, why don't you try this one little area and let's see how it goes. Yeah, I mean, it's probably a a pilot of some sort to see if the idea works. So exactly. So now your business up to then is, you know, you how many sheep do you have? And, you know, tell us about the sheep, you know? Well, we, we have a bunch of sheep and the numbers change throughout the year. They go up, they go down, but we have three different flocks of sheep that we're running right now. First, our original sheep flock were Suffolk sheep. Suffolks are, they're known as the ponies of the sheep world. They're twice the size of normal sheep. They have black faces and black legs with cream colored, wool covered bodies. They're a wonderful sheep. I I like them quite a lot. They do a great job on solar, but they're large, large animals. And then we have a flock of border lesters. Border lesters are more of a standard size sheep. You know, the Suffolk's ewes are about 250 pounds. The border lester ewes are about 125, 135 pounds. They're another great sheep, a wool sheep, and a wool sheep with a much finer, higher quality wool than the Suffolk's have. They compete favorably with merino sheep and produce a wonderful fiber that hand spinners really love to work with. They do a great job as well, but again, still a little on the large side. And then we have a flock of Katahdins. Katahdins are a unique sheep. They were bred in Katahdin, Maine. They're a winter hardy sheep, but they're a hair sheep. They don't grow wool. They, they grow a thick woolly coat that insulates them, protects them all winter long. But in the spring, that woolly coat, they have what's called hair break. Their coat falls out and they look like they've been sheared. That has a bunch of great advantages for the solar grazing operation. So we've been growing that flock dramatically. The Katahdins are smaller. They have a higher rate of twins, which is important from the farming aspect. The fact that they shed does a few things for us. One is it reduces overhead per animal. Two is it means that I don't have to worry about coordinating shearing with the grow season. I don't like to put wool sheep with a winter's worth of wool growth out on solar arrays, simply for heat reasons. Once summer hits, we all shed our winter coats. And I don't want the animals to be stressed because they're carrying too much wool under the solar array. The Katahdins shed as soon as the temperatures climb, so we don't have to schedule all of that. We can get out in the field earlier with the Katahdins. So do these sheep never meet one another? They don't meet each other. They could, but for biosecurity purposes, you know, each flock has its own set of things, their own set of health challenges. And all three of our flocks are very healthy, Whatever challenges they may have, they manage well. But when you cross them, you know, if we allow the suffix to interact with the Katahdins, whatever parasites the Katahdins have that they're resistant to, the suffix may not be resistant to and vice versa. So we keep them separate. How many approximately are in a, in a flock? We have uh, 150 right now in each flock out in the field. So now... This first solar customer says, okay, let's give it a shot. How far from your farm is it? And like, you know, now you're going to be taking care of this flock, but it's not near your house. You know, like what are the challenges now that you have to go through in your mind and and overcome in that first client? The first client, we worked with them to select a site, knowing that it was going to be challenging to be raising animals off our property, particularly for the first time. Like you said, it was exactly a pilot program. So we picked a site on a commercial cattle farm. So it was an array built behind a commercial cattle farm, but we know everyone in the area is used to livestock being there. 
And that was a help. And it's pinned, right? It's pinned. Yes, exactly. We've got an eight foot high chain link fence all the way around this array. It's good farmland. There were professional herdsmen there. This was a beef cattle farm. They had professional managers there who would call me and say, hey, Dan, I, I took a ride by and I checked the sheep. They're all there. Everybody's happy. Or, hey, somebody had a half a limp. You might want to come up and look. That was a help to us. But it was 27 miles away from our base. And you start off with all the things, you know, making a list of what these animals need and how we're going to satisfy it. So we know we've got feed for them. There's plenty of grass, plenty to eat. Right. We know we've got a fence around them to protect them from predators. But that fence is really designed to exclude vehicles and human beings. So we use an electric fence inside that perimeter fence to ensure that the animals are safe. No ability for coyotes to get at them or foxes or, or domestic dogs for that matter. So we, we brought our electric fence, we set that up, we bring the sheep, and then we have a, a proprietary water system that ensures that whatever number of sheep we have there, we can scale this up or scale it down. We ensure that the sheep have a month's worth of fresh drinking water available to them at all times. We're there a couple times a week checking on them, but at any point were the truck to go down or a hurricane to pass through, those animals will have drinking water for at least a month. That was important to us. And those are the kinds of challenges when you take your farm on the road that you need to think about. How are you going to haul water and deliver water to the animals? How are you going to keep them safe? How are you going to ensure they have enough to eat? So we have a water system, electric fence, and a remote monitoring system. So at any time, 24 hours a day, I can open up my cell phone. I can look at my sheep. I can look at the water. Those are a lot of technical solutions that you talked about, Reggie. Reggie's an Australian sheepdog, so he's very smart, but he's not hey, going to be... It's Regina. Where did she come from? She came from a farm in Western Massachusetts. She's kind of a, kind of a fancy dog. Right. She's, she's very highly bred and highly trained, more highly trained than I am. Before you got her, she was trained? Yes. She was trained by a veterinarian and sheep farmer out in Western Mass who is campaigning to win the National Herding Dog Trials. Ah, uh, okay. When you do that, it's sort of like playing polo. You don't have one dog, you have a, a fleet of dogs. And if right. you win that national championship, the way you monetize that is by breeding the dog. Right. Reggie has a couple of things that led the responsible breeders to have her spayed. Mm. One is she has a, a slight overbite, which results oh. in her tongue hanging out and smiling all the time. <laughs> right. And the other is her, the tips of her ears are have white tips on them. And the right. border collar marking should be a solid black ear. Right. So Reggie Spade and a spectacular dog that might have won the herding trials. Right. The woman who was training her doesn't want to win with a spade dog. So right. she said, I... I love this dog. I keep working this dog, but I, I need to get this dog out of my stable. Uh, here. And so Reggie and I worked together for a summer. And at the end of the summer, I said, there's no way I can't take this dog on. It was just such a, a remarkable impact on the business. Yeah. And I just adore her. Now, she's not going to be there. Do you have to leave a guardian livestock dog there? Like a dog that just guards the herd? She manages the sheep, but she works with me. So she comes and goes with me. She herds the sheep. She puts them where we need them. She helps us load the trailer. The livestock guardian dogs that you're talking about, that's something that we've considered. We've worked with them over the years, but we haven't deployed them in the solar grazing business yet for a couple of reasons. One is we haven't had a driving need yet. Our electric fence has worked to keep our animals safe. Two is we're in southeastern Massachusetts where the population density is high. These livestock guardian dogs, they're absolutely wonderful. They're bonded to the flock of sheep. They live with the sheep year round and they protect them. The way they protect them is by barking all night long and killing anything that comes close to those sheep. And with the population density we have here, in many ways, I'd love to do it, but I feel like it would be irresponsible to put out a hundred pound dog that is there 24 hours a day, barking all night long and feeding itself. So we have a couple of sites that are very remote. There are no neighbors. There, there are no domestic dogs that may happen upon the flock and there are coyotes and bears. And we have considered deploying livestock guardian dogs there. We were just discussing this last night, as a matter of fact. So the grass grows in these places. If it takes a couple of weeks to mow it with a sheep, uh, what do you call them? 
What do we call it? What did the kid call it? A lamb. Oh, the lambscapers. The lambscapers. The yeah, yes, lambscaper yes. takes two or three weeks. Doesn't the sheep just need to be there year round or is not year round, but close to it? Like there's no reason to bring them back, you know? So is that the scalability of the business right there? You've actually outlined two different methods for managing the sheep flock on the road. And we do both. So for some sites, what we do is match the flock to the land and forage that's available. And the sheep spend the entire grow season in that one solar site. So they come in in you know, mid April, late April, and they'll stay to the middle of October or into November, depending on how our grow season shapes up that given year. And we'll rotate the sheep within that site. The things that we like about that is, well, for one, there's less stress on the animals if we're not trailering them about. For two, we burn less gasoline if we're not towing a livestock trailer. Three is the soil health improvements really show much more quickly when we continue to rotate these sheep and graze it continuously during the grow season. That site needs to have strong fencing because the sheep will be there for so long that every predator in the neighborhood will learn that they're there. That site needs to have high quality forage needs a variety of plant species there so that our sheep will be healthy and, and get the nutrition they need. Other sites are, are perhaps more of a fescue, more, more like a lawn, not necessarily a monoculture, but there isn't quite enough variety there. Or maybe the fence is strong enough, but we know given the local coyote population, we don't want to leave sheep there for, for five months. We want to keep them moving. Or the, the distance, you know, there are business decisions behind it as well, because we need to manage these sheep and be there regularly. So some sites we graze continuously during the grow season. Others we mob graze or pulse graze are the two terms you hear for that. For example, we could have just back of the envelope for discussion purposes, say you had a five acre site, we could put 15 or 20 sheep there and graze them throughout the grow season, moving them back and forth. Or we could come in with 50 sheep, graze it in a week, move to the next site and come back in six weeks. So we're still rotationally grazing it, but we're grazing it in one lump sum and then returning to that six weeks later. Either way, you can execute the rotational grazing strategy, but, but two different ways to do the same thing. Now, a solar farmer, you know, there's no reason that they need grass, or is there a reason? Oh, there need is. Grass? Okay. There is. The grass that you see on these solar arrays is actually an important part of that facility. First and foremost, the grass stabilizes the soil. When you build a solar array, your goal here is to build this asset that's going to generate power. You're going to put a fence around it. You're going to close the gate and lock it. You're going to come back in 30 years and return that soil back to the way it was. One of your big concerns is erosion. You can't have these panels toppling over. Right. So that grass is important because the root systems go down, they stabilize the soil. So when there's rainwater, it helps deal with runoff, absorb water, keep that moisture in the soil. That moisture in the soil is important for the electrical generation. University of Oregon has done a study that shows that these vegetated sites produce more power than sites that have stone dust under them or something like that. Why would that be? The reason for that is, again, back to those root systems, the grasses are retaining moisture in the soil underneath the solar panels. During the day, that moisture evaporates and it creates a rising column of air, which is cooling the panels. Mm -hmm. Cooler solar panels generate more electricity. Right. And that's another unique thing about the sheep. The rotational grazing strategy helps those root systems go deeper. Grasses weren't meant to be sheared off at two inches once a week. They were meant to be nibbled a little bit over time by animals. And when you manage the grasses that way, the root systems go deeper into the soil. So you're pushing more carbon into the soil, sequestering more carbon by grazing this land with a rotational strategy, retaining more moisture, cooling those panels. Oregon State has shown that you actually can produce more power from a solar array that you graze with sheep than a solar array that you mow. What happens during the snow? What are we doing with the sheep? Well, in the fall, here in New England, we have a grow season that is finite. It starts in the spring, it ends in the fall. And our sheep are out grazing these solar arrays during that whole grow season. In the fall, they come home. They come back to the, the home farm. They're on pasture here, but they're fed dry hay. They're fed some grain supplements to keep their nutrition up. And we breed them. We breed them all. 
and then we have a lambing season. You know, you were asking about taking the show on the road. You then have to shift some of your farming operations because, you know, you put your ram in with the sheep. Five months later, you have lambs. You need those lambs to come at the right time of year so that they're old enough and heavy enough to go out on this remote pasture on solar sites in the spring. So one of the changes we had to make, we, we used to lamb in May, you know, April, May, we'd have our, our lamb delivered. And we've moved that up into the wintertime. So on the home farm, you need to invest in, in the resources to be having lamb born in midwinter. You know, January and February is when we want our lamb to be born so that they're old enough, mature enough to be safe out on open pasture. So you go and you do this first one. How long before you look at the pilot and go, yeah, this worked. It was, it, it made more money for the solar farm and it, you know, you guys did okay. Like how long does that all take? The first site we grazed for one season. And like you said, we, it was a pilot. Uh, it's a giant organization. Portions of that organization were wholly on board from the get-go with the concept. And other portions said, you want to do what on these solar sites? These are industrial power generation sites. And so the, for lack of a better term, naysayers in that organization came out at the launch of the pilot and they brought a lawnmower and they mowed one stripe down the solar array said, okay, there are your sheep, match that. And we did. So after a few weeks, I called the one who was most rejecting of the concept. And I said, what, why don't you take a ride out to the solar site now? And he said, <laughs> oh yeah, I want to see this. And I, I think he, you know, thought this was a little bit of a, a scam. And he got there and I said, find your, find your mower stripe. We couldn't find it. We walked around and by the end of that day, the biggest naysayer was completely in love with it. The sheep were following him around and kissing his hands as we walked this pasture. And he sees how happy and wholesome the sheep are, how green and lush the solar array is, how perfectly maintained the vegetation was. And it, it grew from there. They immediately expanded, starting with the following season. And then we brought on more customers and the, the business has grown dramatically. Now, the grazing strategy, talk about the grazing strategy for a specific area, rotation grazing. Like, what does that mean? And is it labor intensive to have to redraw the areas you want the sheep focused in, you know, to re-fence them? It is. There's a lot of work that's involved in executing a rotational grazing strategy. The nice thing is we would be doing this whether we were working on solar sites or not. It's the best way to manage these animals and it's the best way to manage the earth. So rotational grazing simply means there's time grazing a portion of pasture and then time letting it rest. So the old way is say you had 100 acres of land, you put a fence around the 100 acres, you throw your sheep out there and they eat what's there. It works, but it tends to result in portions of the land being overgrazed. It tends to result in portions of the land dealing with compaction issues, things like that. Farmers have always for millennia moved their livestock onto fresh ground to graze. But rotational grazing is the science-based aspect of that. And to try to answer this in a short version, <laughs> which I'm not good at, imagine a rectangle of grassland in front of you. If you divide that up into six slices, six equal slices, not necessarily on square footage, but on nutrition, you move your sheep into slice number one, they graze that for a week, you move them from number one to number two. Now they're grazing number two and number one is left to rest. You work your way down these slices. When you get to number six and you finish that, you go back to number one, which has now had six weeks rest. That gives all those plants a chance to regenerate, grow those root systems deeper, push that nutritious part of the plant higher and allows you to graze this land without grazing as low. There's benefits to that. So it reduces inputs to your sheep. Sheep are susceptible to parasites, specifically to worm, barber pole worm. When the sheep eat right down to the ground level, which they're willing to do without really damaging the plants, they won't rip them out of the ground like a goat would. They'll, they'll nibble it right down to the soil level. You increase their exposure to parasites. With a rotational grazing strategy, you can leave more grass there, four inches of grass on the ground when you move your sheep to the next place, reduces the need to deworm your sheep, reduces the parasite load on them. Now, you own this farm before you start, and you already have 150 sheep on the yes. farm? So, yes. So how has it changed the, the farm itself, this new business where you're 
you're not just keeping them at the home. You're taking the sheep out. Have you had to hire more people? Have you had more trucks? You know, how has it changed your business? Yeah, and also, do you have the three different types of sheep that you talked about at your one place, and do you keep them separated? We have a couple of base farms. So we have our one base farm here where I'm sitting today in Mansfield, and our wool sheep are here. And then we have another farm 10 minutes away. We're proud of that, too. This is a historic sheep farm in the town of Easton, which had fallen into disrepair. It's a publicly owned piece of land. And we've signed a lease with the town of Easton, and we've brought that historic sheep farm back online. We're cleaning it up, and we're raising sheep there as well. And we're operating that farm as a public park. We're building a visitor parking lot there. Folks can come. They can learn about grazing animals. They can walk through our pasture and see the animals. We've got a network of trails on conservation land where they can go hike. It's a place where families can come. They can see animals grazing, living the way they're supposed to live. They can walk. They can buy grass-fed lamb or eggs. It's a, a nice operation there. and allows us to keep these flocks separate. It's about a 10-minute drive from here. So that's an increase in overhead as you've started the business. There are a lot of increases in overhead here. You know, when you're farming just on your property, the pickup truck you need to go to the local grain mill and the local feed store every couple of weeks is not the same pickup truck you need to drive all over reliably and manage these sheep. So there's, there's investment in trucks, in trailers, in water systems, in handling systems that are portable. We often do our veterinary checks out on the solar arrays, and we have a portable handling system that allows us to work these animals one-on-one -on -one safely and without stressing them. So there's a number of investments you have to make to take this on the road, and there's a cost-benefit analysis that, that each farmer needs to do. There's also, we are taking the place of a, of a commercial landscaper. So in addition to all the farming investments that you need to make, you also need to go out and purchase the same kinds of insurance that these commercial landscapers have. You know, we have a couple million dollars in liability insurance, million dollars on each of the trucks. You have to pay workers' comp insurance. All of that kind of stuff takes place as well. Now, you owned the farm the entire time you were working off the, you know, in the corporate America, yeah? In corporate yes, America. So when you came back and you said, I want to do this, was there resistance to the idea on the farm or was everybody like, yeah, okay, let's give it a shot? Well, everybody was on board with that. It's, it's very challenging to have a profitable farm in southeastern Massachusetts. The price per acre on land, the tax rates, the expense for trucking in hay, it's very challenging for farmers and not just in Massachusetts, across the country. It's very challenging for a family farm to stay profitable. With the corporation agreeing to this kind of grazing idea, you know, you having to truck these sheep out there, you know, you found a way to reinvent the family farm. Is the solar array okay with the pricing right away, or do you have to slowly bring them up to where the pricing is, or does it all work right away? You know, we work hard to manage our overhead, and we're very cost conscious. You know, managing cost is a key component in agriculture. If you can make it you know, if you can build it, if you can repurpose it, that's what you need to do. So we come in and, and we're competitive with commercial landscapers. There are some solar sites where we're cheaper than a commercial landscaper, given the terrain, the challenges in construction technique, things like that, because we're not running tractors. You know, a great example of that would be, imagine a solar array. If, if you're a skier and you know the fall line, the steep part of a slope, if your solar panels are set perpendicular to the slope, it's very challenging to drive a tractor down those roads. Right. We're often cheaper than a commercial landscaper on those sites. If you have a very accessible, completely flat site with panels built way off the ground and folks can run a tractor up and down that with no effort, it's harder for us to be competitive on price. But price isn't really the only reason these solar companies are coming to us either. You need to be competitive on price, but we're offering a host of other benefits to these companies. We're fertilizing this pasture as we graze it. We're helping them to be cleaner and greener. The risk reduction aspect is significant. We've all hired an electrician at our homes. Imagine if you're hiring an electrician to work on not just one house, but a piece of equipment that's generating enough power to power a thousand homes for a year. Each time there's some damage to that array from mowing, that's a very, very expensive electrician call to make. 
So there's a holistic view of the operating cost on the solar site, and maybe we might be a teeny bit more per acre on some sites, but we're saving you hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in electrical calls, in downtime. I think it's also, you mentioned something to the reputational benefit as well for the company, right? I mean, because you were in the ESG space, so the walk, talk the talk, like do it all the way. That's really what pushes these customers over the finish line. You know, it's very easy to evaluate commercial landscapers. How many pieces of equipment do you have? What's the age of your equipment? How many employees do you have? Send me pictures of your uniforms. Give me a review. Send me your certificates of insurance. It's easy to compare. When you come up and say, I have wholesome, healthy animals. I have the experience to manage this pasture properly. You're asking a lot of your customer to try to evaluate that. It's easier to hire a landscaper. What pushes these companies over the line in the end is simply a sense that this is the right thing to do. They've taken farmland offline while they built a solar array. They can put that farmland back online. And I think that's really the key thing that pushes these companies to make this decision. Makes How sense. long does it take before other farmers look at this and go, well, wait a minute, this is a way for us to get on track again. And all of a sudden you have competitors. Well, it's happening. It's happening. And it's wonderful. If there's a way that we can help family farms like ours stay in operation, stay in production, keep that farm for the next generation, I'm proud of that. The fact that there are others doing the same thing is one of the things I'm most proud of. And I talk to farmers every day who reach out to me through our website or, or call me directly to say, hey, you know, we got a family farm in Ohio. We've been raising sheep all these years and we want to do this. We'll help them. We'll help them. We'll teach now, them how to do it. You know, when you worked in corporate America, you know, maybe not in the ESG space, but, you know, it's a cutthroat world. The values of family farmers are a bit different, you know, so there's not that competitive feeling there's a shared feeling about what the world is and how it should work. How would you describe the way farmers think about the world? Well, first, when they look out at the world, I think we see something different. We see land to care for. We see land that will care for us, that will provide for our family. I think it's a different worldview. And I think we have a very sophisticated view of industry and economics. A lot of these farmers are managing massive budgets to run these farms. They're very sophisticated business people. And we know that you need an industry to be successful. You can't do this on your own. So yes, there's a part of me that wants to be the only solar grazer and, and I graze all the solar array, but that isn't effective. We need, we need competitors. We need an industry. We need counterparties. And one of the things that's important to Solar Shepherd is, is the acknowledgement that not everyone can do this and not everyone wants to do this. Who's a farmer? Farming is a very diverse industry. So when we charge these solar companies to graze their land, we go back and we find in every community we operate, we find a hay farmer. We know we're going to need to buy hay for this winter. Let's find somebody in each community we operate and we'll buy a portion of our winter feed from them. We will buy locally sourced grain from them. We will hire their kids to help in the wintertime on our family farm. We want to make sure that the revenues that we're getting from grazing are pushed back through the agricultural economy, that it's shared. So folks who want to learn how to do this, we'll teach them how to do this. We'll, we'll talk to them. You know, if we fast forward 10 years into the future and look at what solar grazing looks like, I would like it to be family farms. Individual family farms operating like we are with some geographical remit that they can manage effectively and responsibly. I'd like to not see it be some publicly traded giant agricultural conglomerate where, you know, there's some home office that's taking 90% of the revenue off the farmer's plate. I'd like this to stay a family operation. And, you know, originally you wanted to get back outside. Do you get to spend a lot of time outside now? I do. I do. I'm outdoors all day, every day. You know, the normal day starts at about sunrise. Reggie and I sit together and have our cup of coffee and snuggle. She likes to sit on my lap while I drink my there coffee in the morning. Did she come back? She's back. Yeah, she's Sorry, I got my own. Back I got because my own. it's been an hour. I want to see. <laughs> you sent her out for the hour for the podcast. But... Yeah. She'll be back at some point. Yeah. So, we, you know, we, we snuggle and drink our coffee and think about our day. And then we head out. We have rams here. Our large breeding rams stay on the home farm year round. We don't put those out on solar sites. 
So we get up, we feed our animals here, we feed them hay and grain, move them around on pasture, we load up the truck, we drive to the other farm, and we do the same thing with the rams over there, and then we're out on the road. This afternoon, we're going to drive halfway across Massachusetts to a beautiful solar site. We're going to round up 75 ewes there. We're going to load them into a trailer, and we're going to take them about 10 miles away to another beautiful solar site. The solar site that they're on now is in Brookfield, Massachusetts. It's a gorgeous solar array. The land has been in production since before the colonial era. When the colonists made their way west from Boston and hit that, that land was maintained as an open pasture by the Nipmuc Indians. And that land has been in production as far back as recorded history goes in this area. And the solar company that built that company called Sweb, they built that solar array without damaging the vegetation that was there. So we have this 400 year old pasture that we're grazing and it's fantastic for the animals. They finished up the job there and we're moving them 10 miles away to another open piece of pasture land, solar site. The soil is not quite as good. The solar company built this solar array and they planted it with pollinators. And right now it's a chest high field of clover and flowers and just spectacularly gorgeous. And I, I can't wait for these ewes to get on there. They're gonna be thrilled. Um, the challenge will be seeing each other. There's so much thick, lush vegetation there. For them. Yeah, well, they'll get through it pretty quick, I imagine. Oh, they will. They yeah. will. Well, thank you so much for sharing all this with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate the the opportunity to tell folks about this and yeah. and encourage them to look into it more, learn more. You know, we've got a website. It's uh, solarshepherd.com. You can learn more there. There's the American Solar Grazing Association, solargrazing.org. It's a 501c6 organization. I sit on the executive board. It's, uh, we offer a bunch of resources for other farmers who might be interested in learning about this and, and seeing if it's something that would make a difference for them. And then there's the National Center for Appropriate Technology, which is a government-funded operation that helps farmers deploy environmentally friendly solutions. And they're helping train and connect people on the solar grazing opportunity as well. So there's three resources for folks who want to learn more. Thank you very, very much. Thank this you was so fantastic. Much, Great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Pleasure meeting you both.